I would like to invite Archbishop Gullickson, uh, who is with us, uh, to just open us with a brief prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. amen. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and enkindle in them the fire of your love. Send forth your spirit, and they shall be created, and you shall renew the face of the earth. Saint Holy Mary, seed of wisdom, pray for us. Saint Joseph, on your feast day today, pray for us. And Saint Thomas Aquinas, pray for us. In the, name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. amen. Thank you, Archbishop. In 2019, I received a phone call from the one and only Dr. Joseph Bottom, asking if Mount Marty University would be interested in working together to start an event that would highlight the Catholic intellectual tradition in the Diocese of Sioux Falls. Now, if you're not familiar with Jody, uh, my first thought was, Jody, how'd you get my number? And my second thought was, Jody, don't you live on the East Coast? Jody was a longtime public intellectual, has been a longtime public intellectual, who is the editor of the Weekly Review and Journal First Things. It happened that he and his wife had decided to return home to the Black Hills, and he was looking for an outlet for his intellectual life, and he found the state in our diocese a bit anemic. A diocese as wonderful as ours has lacked one thing, and that is depth to its intellectual wellspring, that vein that runs deep into the history and the tradition from which our intellectual life flows. With that, I thought what better opportunity for Mount Marty University to partner with the Catholic Diocese of Sioux Falls and to work with Jody at this new initiative. And so, five years later, here we are. I immediately hung up the phone and I thought, this is exactly what we need. Dr. Bergwald and his great partnership with the Catholic Diocese of Sioux Falls and Mount Marty University, along with the Cathedral Parish here, uh, are really grateful for your presence here with us tonight. The Benedictine Leadership Institute at Mount Marty University is proud to welcome you to the fifth annual Aquinas Lecture. With that, I'd like to acknowledge some of the leadership that has supported this work. From Mount Marty University, we have a whole contingent of people here and even uh, a cohort of our students that have been able to be with us. Uh, just briefly, Dr. Mark Long, president, is with us, and Dr. Long is in the back over here. Dr. Bill Miller, the provost, is uh, in the mil middle there, and Dr. Nick Shudak, as well as next to him, and he is the dean of undergraduate programs as well as Barb Rizak, I believe Barb's here, Vice President of Advancement and Mission. And Barb's right over here as well. And we can't forget our chaplain, Father Lacey. So Father Lacey, thank you so much for the support and the presence here and to all of those from Mount Marty. We even have board members and former board members that are here with us tonight. From the Catholic Diocese of Sioux Falls, uh, Christopher Motes, Chief of Staff for the Bishop's Office. Christopher, thank you for being here with us tonight. Father Andrew Dickinson, the Vicar General. Father Andrew Dickinson is present here somewhere. Father, thank you. And finally to uh, Dr. Chris Bergwald, uh, Director of Adult Formation uh, for the Catholic Diocese of Sioux Falls. Now I'm sure, I'm certain I've forgotten somebody like Dr. Heron, a theology professor at Mount Marty or somebody, but to everybody, thank you for your support of this wonderful, wonderful initiative. With that, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Bergwald to introduce the 2024 presenter for the Aquinas Lecture, Dr. Bergwald. It's nice that the introducer of the speaker gets applause. That's not normally the thing. So thank you. Uh, as Joe said, my name is Chris Bergwald. I'm the Director of Discipleship Formation with the Diocese. And I'm very excited for that. We've had great speakers, uh, all five Aquinas lectures. But I in particular, this is the one that I sort of championed. I think we need to get Larry Chapp. So the check is in the mail, I think, Larry. Uh, and so it's a, it's a joy for me to be able to introduce Dr. Larry Chapp. To, it's already spent on night, indeed. Um, 
why am I so excited about tonight's topic? So there's an early, one of the early church fathers, uh, Western fathers, a man named Tertullian, early on in the history of the church during a time of great persecution by the Roman Empire, somewhat famously now said, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. The blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. So what Tertullian was describing is this reality that the powerful witness of people who are willing to go to their sometimes very horrific and torturous deaths for faith in Jesus Christ, uh, rather than living by just giving a little pinch of incense to the emperor, that witness was compelling and converting. There were in the, many um, scholars have written about how in the early uh, Christian era, during the time of Roman persecution, there would be Christians who would nurse back to health ill, sick executioners of their friends. So the Romans would see that, and it was obviously compelling. Oh my gosh, like I, I, was, I, I killed so-and-so Christian, and now I'm sick with the plague, and this Christian's friend is literally, literally nursing me back to health. And that was compelling, and over the course of a few centuries, it ended up converting the Roman Empire. The blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. But the word martyr is the key there because it means witness. And this is what, for me, is com particularly compelling about Dr. Chap, and sp especially uh, his, his book that came out just a year or two ago, Confession of a Catholic Worker, Our Current Moment of Christian Witness. What Dr. Chep argues, uh, and, and what I fervently believe as well, is that we, here even in the West, we're, we're not, as in other parts of the country, giving our lives in a literal way for the faith. We're very comfortable, and we're very complacent. We live our easy lives, and we go to Mass, and we pray, but our culture needs more than that from us. Our, the, the title of our lecture tonight, Holiness in an Age of Unbelief. Our culture needs men and women who live radically different lives and bear vibrant witness to Jesus Christ. And that's not only what we see in this book, but that's what you will see in this man who will be speaking tonight. So I just want to read the introduction or the, the inside book cover of Dr. Chap's book, just a part of it. In a cold, dying world, choked by greed, the gospel calls for radical love and radical living according to the Sermon on the Mount. Using the theology of Hans Urs von Balthasar, Peter Marin, and Dorothy Day, Larry Chap argues that the real remedy to the disease of sin is not niceness, is not political liberation, not fancy liturgical dress, not technical rigor, but a free decision to live totally and joyfully in Jesus Christ without compromise. Just as the martyrs chose God over life itself, so each Christian must, in the crucial hour, choose Jesus over all things. Everything hinges on the moment of Christian witness. So it's my joy and my excitement to be able to introduce Dr. Larry Chap. Okay, the water's back there. I I uh, once gave a lecture, put a water bottle right where, here, <laughs> and knocked it over all right onto my talk. And the rest of the talk was ad lib from that point forward, because the whole thing was ruined. So from that point forward, I decided never again put water on your lectern when you're as uh, old fashioned as I am and you still read from paper, paper text. I have to say, thank you so much for that glowing introduction. Uh, makes me seem far more important than I am. And I'm very, very happy to be here, so thanks for the invitation. I grew up in Lincoln, Nebraska, just a short drive down the road, go Big Red. And I, uh, I am very, very happy to be back on the prairie, back on the plains. And uh, so thank you for inviting me. And what a beautiful church, by the way. Stunningly beautiful church. So you should be very proud of it. So thank you. So I'll begin. It is called Evangelization in an Age of Unbelief. It could also be subtitled, The Laity Get the Clergy They Deserve. <laughs> and I mean that, all right? We're always blaming the clergy, blaming the clergy, when in fact the clergy, yeah, you know, they're sacramentally different from us, but not all that different from us in any other way uh, in terms of laity, and they come from the laity. Uh, and, and so I think that's an important thing to keep in mind. Anyway. 
The currently raging white-hot debates in the church that we see so much today are the eruption into full view of a deeper theological and spiritual confusion in the church today. And that confusion is the result of a real deficit of imagination and philosophical and theological and literary death and even simple intellectual curiosity. And as the old Latin adage goes, nemo dat quoad non habit, you cannot give what you don't rightfully possess or have, which means therefore that the contemporary church by necessity tends to obsess over things that it does possess, such as bureaucratic structures and the sex abuse crisis and those sorts of things, uh, rather than necessarily paying very careful attention, I think, to the deeper, deeper root issues at hand. And that is because, theologically speaking, the only thing that the church truly possesses as her own is the crucified and risen Lord. Not property, not buildings, but the crucified and risen Lord. And the moral praxis of the witness of the martyrs who were following the lamb who was slain. And it's precisely this proclamation of and witness to the crucified and risen Lord which has inspired most of the great intellectual and artistic achievements of the past 2,000 years. People did not die for the faith or build beautiful churches like above because it's nice to be nice to the nice. Okay? That's uh, some sort of suburban bromide morality. They died for Christ. And the kingdom logic of this new regime of grace and, and martyrial charity ushered in by Christ was the only real and true revolution that the world has ever seen. And I sometimes think we do not pay enough attention to that. It's the only true revolution the world has ever seen. All other so-called revolutions were merely permutations of either the libido dominandi or attempts at fleeing its tyranny via the path of spiritual withdrawal and apophatic negation. Only Christ, because he was truly God incarnate in full union with the real human nature, could achieve as Athanasius pointed out centuries ago, the full radicalization of creation as being most itself when it is united to what is above. And, we are here, when we, and here we see the precise nature of the Christian revolution in the conjoining together of the images of butchery and glory in the Lamb who was slain, of death and transformation into life. This is our revolution. Indeed, is our only revolution. It is the revolution of a world turned upside down by the crucified Lord. And it is the Christ of the wooden Roman gibbet that is the world's only hope. Let that sink in. As Madeleine Del Brel puts it, writing retrospectively on her time as an atheist, quote, and because you are not here, speaking of God, and because you are not here, the whole world seemed to me small and silly and the fate of all men stupid and cruel. That's in the new book of her writings, The Dazzling Light of God. Indeed, Christ, the, Christ, without Christ, the world is merely a dissipated mess of competing and disordered mimetic desires, as Rene Girard pointed out, in search of violent ways of scapegoating those who stand in our way, allegedly, of possessing all of the shiny objects of our totemized idolatries. But of course, death is also the final barrier that casts a shadow of futility over all such worldly schemes, all such attempts at a different revolution. Death is, but, is the ultimate boundary and therefore we seek to overcome it either by accepting it with an adult and stoic indifference in our lives, an indifference nobody ever really believes or achieves, or to overcome it through some kind of titanistic and Promethean effort in which we seek an ersatz immortality via grand achievements of some kind. But death is the great denier, the great leveler. Quoting Madeleine Del Brel yet again, she says, quote, the great indisputable reasonable misfortune is death. Revolutionaries interest me, but they have misunderstood the question. They can arrange a better world. We will always have to move on, however. Scientists are a bit childish. They still believe that they kill death. They kill dying, ways of dying, rabies, smallpox, but death is doing just fine." End quote. 
It is only in the resurrection of the crucified Christ that the world can transcend this regime of death. And this is what St. Paul meant by the sting, the sting of sin. The sting of sin is death and the mortality that hangs over us all and robs us of the vision we need in order to overcome the moral entropy that drags us down. But the death of the, of the lamb who was slain is the revolution that overcomes this. And this is the Christian revolution. It is the revolution of a new intimacy which alone slakes our thirst for the ecstasy of love. And it is a love which alone has no boundaries and no limits and which cannot be transgressed or trumped by something higher. But this revolution, our revolution, the Christian revolution, has today run up against what is perhaps its greatest challenge, the strange contours of unbelief in the modern world. My claim is that ours is a culture predicated upon what I call the nullification of God as a really real existential option. Therefore, our disbelief is different from the atheism and agnosticism one often found in a pre-modern context. Previous generations saw fire-breathing atheists like Nietzsche, Gott ist tot, God is dead, and Gott bleibt tot, God's going to remain dead. You've got to say it in German. It's got, it's got more for Gott ist tot, all right? Seems more visceral somehow. But he was a serious thinker who still took the faith seriously enough to engage it and whose dark protests against Christianity gave a backhanded witness to the ongoing importance, at least to the question of God. Our era, by contrast, merely yawns at the faith and treats it like a quaint, antiquarian curiosity perpetuated by a shrinking congregation of ignorant dullards who just don't get that modernity and its science has killed that dragon. The world has moved on from the God thingy and now considers those who even raise the question to be antisocial and dangerous obstacles to the latest iteration of technological progress. Therefore, the atheism of today is not overt. That's, that's the point. It's not overt. It's like air. It is more of a de facto atheism of praxis, of practice, and what the French call, pretentiously, perhaps, a mentalité, right, a whole different consciousness grounded in the belief that even if some kind of ultimacy exists, that it is largely unknowable and unprovable and therefore best left to the side of the road as we move inexorably forward with the brave new world of technological progress. The modern world still allows for a certain measure of what, what, it, what we euphemistically call religious freedom, so long as that freedom stays within the boundaries of its dog kennels of dis domesticated and neutered impotence. Spirituality is allowed to remain as a kind of feel-good oozing of Gnostic emotions, signifying nothing more than a kind of health aid to inner calm and better sexual relations. And it is a spirituality that fits nicely with a de facto cultural atheism in a consumeristic register, since its church is the boutique shop at the mall that sells essential oils, CBD products, vapes, books on better living through yoga, and various disgusting tasting green liquids made from plants grown only in Bolivia, apparently. <laughs> I had some once, it was awful. I don't even, some sort of, I don't know, anyway. <laughs> that's, that's why I use that example. Thus, as the sociologists say, Peter Berger in particular, the plausibility structures of our culture have created within all of us a deeply attenuated religious sense in the old-fashioned manner of the spiritual soul seeking its fulfillment in a transcendent God. The wisdom that comes through the putting on of the mind of Christ fades in our culture into the mist of our foggy indifference. In order to see God through the lens of Christ, one needs the spiritual eyes to do so, and yet the very plausibility structures of what we count as the really real in our, in our culture gives us all, all of us, spiritual cataracts that make it extremely difficult to have any genuine spiritual insight. We have to fight, we have to swim upstream to make progress against the current of this culture. And because of the ascendancy of the culture of transgressive nullification, one of the biggest problems we face in engaging it is the fact that the well of discourse has been poisoned from the get-go 
And by, th by that I mean that the very living water we are attempting to give away is rejected toot court from the start as a toxic brew of benighted superstitions that were already tried and found wanting. We've had our day, and now it's past, and nobody wants what it is that we are selling. We are, in the eyes of our world, the religion known for witch burnings, the Crusades, the Inquisition, Galileo, and having too many kids. We are the religion of anti-choice, anti-freedom, anti-everything. We are the religion of niet, which bids us to cry with the saints rather than to laugh with the sinners. I'm not saying that's what I think. I'm saying that's, that's what our culture thinks of us. That's how our culture views us. We are history's wet blanket and a perpetual buzzkill to life's simple pleasures. Of course, all of these cultural realities affect the church and her ordinary members who must swim in this culture every day and are deeply affected, both consciously and subconsciously, by the formal logic of modernity's plausibility structures. Therefore, my further claim is that even if faith exists in the souls of most ordinary Catholics, and I think it does, it remains nevertheless true that the roots of such faith can often be shallow. I see it in, I, by the way, people say, oh, you're so judgmental. No, I'm a leper preaching to other lepers. The reason why I talk about this stuff is because I feel it in me. I grew up just a little suburban kid in the 1960s and 70s, nothing special, let me tell you. And I breathed in this atmosphere that I'm talking about here. All right, Joseph Ratzinger noted this phenomena already in 1958 where he pointed out that most of us in the pews these days are closeted heathens. That's his word, heathens. He wrote a famous article in 58, the, the modern heathens in the church. He said they're masquerading as believing Christians, which is what led him to predict a mere 10 years later that the future church would be much smaller, lack social standing, and will have to undergo an agonizing period of retreat from its former Constantinian glory. In other words, even among those who still profess some semblance of the faith, there's a loss of the sense of intimacy with Christ, with the consequent loss of a sense of participation in the cruciform structure of his existence. There's also, therefore, a very deep, deep alienation from the core evangel of the church amongst millions of Catholics, and a deep sense of meaninglessness, loneliness, depression, despair. We want to believe. We want to believe. And here I'm just engaging in a kind of phenomenology. We want to believe, but find that we cannot. And yet we do believe. That's strange. It seems, therefore, that the strange structure of specifically modern forms of faith are actually forms of a deep, smoldering, even at times searing, unbelief. But an unbelief still that is strangely still belief, somehow, via the crucible of a true desire for God and has changed into a kind of faith that stretches outward towards God as a destitute beggar who has been stripped bare of all pretensions. It's why arguments don't persuade. There's something deeper we seek. We can escape our culture's illusions to a great extent and with great effort, but like the wounds of Christ, the scars remain with us, even after transformation, and the religious ties that bind remain still strangely loosely affixed. Thus there is emerging an entirely new form of sanctity in our world, born out of the negating nullifications of modernity, and it is giving birth to entirely new kinds of saints. The sanctity of vicariously suffered unbelief, a form of crucifixion if you've ever gone through it, transformed into the martyrial witness of unbelief conquered from within. It is a conquest which brings enormous and manifest joy and it is a faith and a sanctity which is most truly at home in the worldly world as a full participant and with eyes wide open. And therefore, it is ultimately kind of essentially a lay form of sanctity, but it's also a form of discipleship that I find an increasing number of priests, bishops, and religious are also drawn to. And that is because the modern bourgeois parish is quite often in crisis, a crisis of faith that mirrors the deep cultural unbelief. And this crisis afflicts priests as much, if not more, than the laity. Many of you, I'm sure, know many, many, many priests. And, I, and uh, we should pray for all of them because they are true heroes. Because what they confront, what they confront today is unprecedented. And this is my point. 
What this means is that many Catholics today exist in a deeply ambiguous relationship with the so-called institutional church. It is a relationship that can be characterized as the typical parishioner being an insider, insofar as his or her mass attendance is relatively consistent, and yet nevertheless on the level of emotions and existential commitment, and ideology even perhaps, an outsider. This too is an alienation from the intimacy with Christ. Only in this case, it is an alienation from the Christ who comes to us in the sacraments. Much has been made of the Pew research that shows that a majority of Catholics in the United States no longer believe or don't quite understand in the doctrine of the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist. I'm sure you're all familiar with that. And much hand-wringing has been done about the need in the light of this for better catechesis and preaching. But even though all, that is all well and good, it really is, and we need that. But it does not address the deeper phenomenology of what is happening here. And that is the crisis of alienation from intimacy with Christ via the sacraments of the church. Because that church has not recognized in many ways the essentially agonistic and secularized aspects of the faith of so many Catholics. It has not recognized the alienation and it has not recognized that many Catholics are actually psychological outsiders to the church even if they sit in the pews every Sunday. And I'm not saying here they're in the pews for other reasons, but they, they're, they're just kind of indifferent. I mean, they're in the pews and they believe, but there's something off. There's something not quite connecting. But there are still reasons for hope. But it will require more than the tired categories of most Catholic responses to modernity up to this point, at least in my opinion. Radical traditionalism, Catholic progressivism, and standard form Catholic conservatism all fall short in various ways, I think. None of them are radical enough, which means none of them actually understand themselves all that well. Lacking a true Christos Christocentric cruciform radicality, traditionalism is not nearly traditional enough. Catholic progressivism is not progressive at all, but simply the parodying of intellectual fashion. And standard form conservative Catholicism tends to be simply Whig, Whig bourgeois liberalism at prayer. They all have their strengths and weaknesses, and they all have sincerely devoted Catholics within their ranks, and I know many of them are good friends with many of them. Better Catholics than I am, many of them for sure. But as a response to the nullification of God and modernity and the deep culture of disbelief, I think they're all shadow boxing failures. Now, I have, people say, well, what's your idea, Mr. Smarty Pants? <laughs> I ain't got one. Uh, I have no program or strategy for the best way forward in our evangelization, not in, not in concrete terms. And that is because this, this is not something that can be thought out in advance in some ersatz committee with mission statements, and you, you know the drill, and published as a series of documents from the bishops' conference, sorry for the bishops that are here, uh, documents from the bishops' conference, as if the spiritual crisis we face can be met through the development of new bureaucratic maneuverings. And I'm not saying the bishops think that that's what will happen, but, I, but we all seem trapped in this same old way of doing things, even though we know that it doesn't work. The solution is going to have to bubble up from below. As new saints emerge and new forms of sanctity are inspired by the Holy Spirit, in, in ways that elude anything that can be captured in listening sessions, we face what Balthasar called, Hans Urs von Balthasar called in German, our Ernstfall moment of Christian witness. And Ernstfall means a moment of decisional crisis in which we must choose what form our sanctity will take in today's world of a nullified God. And that will require a true listening to the spirit of the crucified and risen Christ and not the whisperings of the zeitgeist on superficial hot button issues while sitting around circular tables in Rome babbling about being a church on the move. And all humor aside, and I do find that humorous, I covered this in it last fall, I'm not gonna go down that rabbit hole. All humor aside, the Synod on Synodality is a veritable case study in, e in ecclesial problematic, I think, and of our seemingly bottoms, bottomless ability to miss the point of everything while sitting in on endless committee meetings. It is imperative that we understand this point if we are to grasp fully the, the kind of sanctity, the kind of saint that we need today. 
And once as true sanctity transcends all historicization and localization, which is why you can't really come up with a program. It's not entirely reducible to anything other than a radical openness to the unique provocation of the call of Christ. And therefore, this Christological holiness is falsified at its root, at its root, when holiness is reduced to a mere sociological construct invented in committees or synods by tired people who speak incessantly of this or that movement of the Holy Spirit, which they have now apparently captured, analyzed, and reproduced in bureaucratic form as a manufactured reform of structures and disciplines. My friend Louis Ayers, a theologian, cheekily describes this process as salvation by PhD alone, which is just another way of saying the kind of false deference to the expertise of the elites so common today, which of course means that we can only discern the meaning of holiness and of the basic demands of Christian existence after a rigorous round of coursework from various scholars like me and experts in hermeneutics, sociology, psychology, comparative religion. And I'm not anti-intellectual, not at all. But that's not where in holiness resides. Seen in this light, we can confidently assert that there is precious little in life more evil than a committee. <laughs> and I, you know, I say, I say that as having been at a university and sat on every committee known to men. I went, I went to, I, I, I taught at DeSales University near Allentown, PA. Former president there, Father Dan Gambit, great guy. Uh, was very opposed to committees. <laughs> he, used to, he had a way of speaking, was kind of like this, and he was a very stately fellow, big shock of gray hair. Said, Larry, he was, never give to a committee what one single competent person can do. <laughs> and I said, yes, <laughs> Father Gambit. But all humor aside, you know, the, it, it is the natural corollary to, moderni to modernity's use of experts and elites committees to create an assemblage of alleged authorities who nobody can touch. This is a reality known long ago by the prescient and underappreciated genius that was Ivan Illich. A committee by constitutive orientation creates anonymity via plausible deniability in the fog of process. It thereby sublates decision to contrive consensus, thus, thus negating the prophetic. And the consensus it, re it reaches evaporates like manna in the midday heat. It hammers square pegs into round holes and then proclaims that everything has always already been circular anyway. There's never anything angular, pointed, or sharp, or dangerous in a committee, and the facilitator is always there to make sure that nobody ever runs around with scissors in hand. And that is as true, perhaps even more so, in, in ecclesial contexts as it is in secular ones. For example, whatever one's views of Vatican II and mine are very positive, there can be no doubt that it did have one primary flaw. And that flaw was precisely the effort to forge a consensus via committees where no consensus existed. The Pope, Paul VI, sought to end the various theological divisions in the church via the path of committee consensus. Everything was constantly getting, if you know anything about the history of Vatican II, the debates would be on the floor. Paul VI would send it back to the Theological Commission. You guys argue it out. Monsignor Phillips, great French, would come up with a, a, a formula or two that would be the great, the great conciliator, and, and boom, then the documents would get passed. The Pope sought to end those divisions that way, but it was a consensus grounded in little more than a desire to please the Pope, and it evaporated as soon as everyone went home from the party. But one aspect of the conciliar mystique perdured, and that was the very notion that the Holy Spirit putatively moves best in committees and does so regardless of the evangelical holiness or theological perspicacity of its participants. The mere presence of the committee as a formal process that allegedly facilitates democratic dialogue is deemed to be the ex opere operato principle above all others these days. It's also a form of pagan magical thinking since the Holy Spirit is able to accomplish these goals apparently without the consent or holiness of those involved. The pixie dust of modernity, which is democratic structures devoid of teleology, creates the faux patina of participation, which masks over what are in fact deeply totalitarian impulses. All of this is key to my analysis here about sanctity, believe it or not, all of this sidebar conversation on committees. It's no way tangential. The hidden beast of modernity with which we contend is precisely a beast 
I get that piece from a poem by a, a, a Polish poet, Zbigniew Herbert. Anyway, precisely a beast who hides in the shadows and who inhabits the cracks and fissures of traditional institutions, thus undermining them from within via the processes of those institutions. It is the long march through the institutions, as the old Marxist adage goes, that hollows them out while leaving them seemingly intact outwardly. Such co-opted and hollowed out institutions are thus useful in the slow suffocation of us all. This hollowing out is therefore also a form of cultivated cultural amnesia, where, as in the case of the church, what is forgotten beyond the tradition is being as such, and of course, Christ. Christ is considered by too many, I believe, in our church, like, like a running kid with scissors. He's too wild and untamed to be allowed to lope around the church at will, and it is committees that tame him, study groups. This is the central point of Dostoevsky's Grand Inquisitor in the Brothers Karamazov. Christ gave us too much freedom. We are here to take away the effects of that freedom. Louis Bouillet, great theologian, one of my favorites, one of the key theologians at Vatican II, in the light of what he deemed the bitter fruits of the post-conciliar era, in his memoirs, weeped bitterly, weeped bitterly about the great, great fruit of the council and how it had been co-opted essentially in this bureaucratic malaise that came after. Likewise, Ratzinger, Joseph Ratzinger, Pope Benedict, warned us long ago of the dangers of what he called an ecclesiasticism that elevates ecclesial process to an idolatrous level. This constant fixation, this navel staring, what are the structures of the church? Uh, does anybody in here actually, please somebody, after the talk, please tell me, what is synodality? I'm just going to throw that out there to you. <laughs> what is it? Has it been defined? No, it hasn't. And in fact, I know Diane Montagna, who writes for the, the National Catholic Register. When I was in Rome in October covering the Synod, she specifically asked the Synod organizers at a press conference, please define for us synodality. And they answered, we can't. We can't answer it because we won't know what it is until we do it. You know, and, and you know, I don't know. <laughs> anyway, I, I don't want to, I'm trying to be good here. <laughs> All right. All else is vanity, says Joseph Ratzinger. All else is vanity. All else is just spiritual junk food. The empty ecclesial calories of loquacious folks chattering away. Therefore, the true revolution can only be recovered as it has always been recovered by the emergence of the creativity of the saints. And this is my point. What we have lost in the bureaucratization of modern life and has this has affected and infected the church. What we have lost is precisely the provocation of an individual saint and that we're all called to be that. And if we look carefully at the church over the past century, we see the telltale signs of a sanctity that is evincing a clear preferential option for life in the world and solidarity with that world, even while being a mere sojourner in that world. A pilgrim people, as Vatican II put it. Thus do we see, these days, a double alienation from the modern parish, I think. On the one hand, you have the millions of what I described, the insider-outsider Catholics, but you also now have the alienation of those Catholics who desire a more radical form of Christian life that takes the form of being both in the world and yet radically different from the world. I see these people all the time. They come to my farm all the time. These are the visitors to our Catholic worker farm. A lot of them Catholics, a lot of them not, but most of them Christian of some kind. And what they're all seeking is in some sense a different way of living than what our world, our, our country, our culture puts out for them, especially for their children. And that the church does not seem to be a place that offers alternatives. You can call these Catholics, these seeking Catholics, whatever you want, avant-garde Catholics, back to the land Catholics, dive bar Catholics, bohemian art colony Catholics, urban homesteading Catholics, classical education and homeschooling Catholics, you know the list. The fact remains that their attempts at rewilding are often at odds, often at odds with what is a deep and stultifying spiritual boredom that is the standard life of so many, too many parishes. My friend Chris Altieri, the journalist, in an insightful article in Crux magazine, takes note of the repeated insistence of Pope Francis and his ecclesiastical allies that the church needs to be welcoming to everyone. 
And Chris agrees with that. I agree with that. I'm glad Pope Francis does that. And we are told the church is a big tent, a field hospital, and is open to one and all, and that God loves you just as you are. And those are all true statements, and God bless Pope Francis for being so insistent on those things. But Altieri notes, correctly in my view, that in some ways there is a deeper point that is being missed in all of this. And it's an issue I've tried to outline here. And that there is a much deeper question that modern people are asking. And it isn't, am I welcome in this church? No. It's why should I bother with this church at all? Why should I care? My wife spins wool. You know, we, she, we have sheep. We shear them. We process the wool. She spins it. She teaches people how to do it. She invites me. She goes to all these fiber festivals, whatever that is. And she invites me to go to them. And I say, okay, that's great. And she says, you're welcome. I said, that's great. I'm not going. <laughs> Why? Because I don't care. I find the whole thing boring, boring, boring. All right, that's her shtick. Uh, and, and, and she goes and does it. But that's, that's my point here. The point is, I, I feel very welcome by the Fiber Guild, but I don't care about the Fiber Guild. <laughs> this question is the critical one, is often overlooked in these discussions. As Altieri states, uh, you know, we, we need to get back to a asking the question of whether or not we have something that people are looking for. The pastoral reality is, is, is dire in, the, in this regard. And the a typical person, I said, is not concerned with, am I welcome in this church, but what is attractive and interesting? I'm reminded, uh, I, I, I would highly recommend, those of you who are not familiar with him, the writings of a French novelist, George Bernanos, uh, he, he describes this modern boredom of the believer as long ago as 1937 in his book, The Diary of a Country Priest, which I would highly recommend everybody read. It's fantastic. I reread it once every year. Diary of a Country Priest, the, the hero of the story. It's a, it's, a, it's a story about sanctity in the modern world, about a priest living in a culture of unbelief. And he has the young cure, the hero, say at the very beginning, quote, this is on page one. My parish is bored stiff. No other word for it, like so many others. We can see them being eaten away by this boredom, and we can't do anything about it, end quote. That's shocking. That's, that's kind of haunting. There's nothing we can do about it. Boredom, not exclusion, is the existential cancer that is eating away at the church's vitals. And in my view, no amount of, of bureaucratic maneuverings is going to change that. It is a boredom that is far darker than the dark night of a believer in the grips of the dark night of the soul or of spiritual acedia. This is the boredom of a cultural nihilism with a consumerist happy face masking the despair that is smoldering in its embers. And if we just keep doubling down on the same old, same old, same old, it's going to be as useful as a defibrillator in a morgue. Therefore, the cultural adversary we face today knows that the saint of today, those possessed with a missional sanctity oriented to the resistance of what Balthazar called the system, is the only obstacle remaining in the path of total control of human destiny technocratically. Romano Guardini echoed this same sentiment long ago, and he grounds the perceptive new eyes that sanctity brings in the awareness that we are not now as we are intended to be. In other words, original sin. The saint of today must therefore be one who can image this new way of living for people today. But you know, I've been saying this over and over. I've been talking now for half an hour, saying the same, we need to have a new way of living. That sounds so cliche. So anodyne, so boilerplate. We are told that we must meet people where they are today. Yeah, fine. But where is that? Exactly. What does that even mean? Because what if the person of today, existentially speaking, is nowhere? Modernity, after all, is that which removes all binding spiritual addresses. We can knock on the doors, but nobody is ever home. Nobody actually lives there anymore. Balthazar noted the ambiguity we face in this regard with deep spiritual precision. Quote, the slogan is much brooded about these days that we should try to meet modern man where he is. So severe is this situation that most teachers of religion ask with equal justice, 
just who these ruins are whom we should try to meet against their will most of the time, where they are. A missionary has it relatively easy. He encounters a perhaps primitive anima naturaliter Christiana. But where is the famous point of contact with the anima technica vacua? I, for one, certainly do not know. Some table wrapping, a seance or two, some dabbling in meditation, a smattering of liberation theology, enough. What, and I like liberation theology, by the way, but anyway. What Balthazar is affirming here is that there is very little in the way of a point of contact between the gospel and a vision of life grounded in a vacuous technocratic paradigm. And that is something that we cannot simply ignore. The saint of today, therefore, will be someone who can give to people a new binding address to try to take away that nowhere. When we, address, when we try to find where people are spiritual, we discover they're nowhere. And we discover we're not anywhere where we thought we were either. And so we have to be about creating new binding addresses, that which convicts. And that address will be the recentering and rehoming of life by rendering where you are at that time and place into the binding address of Christ. And if there's any program I have, it's that. There's no specific way of life here to recommend other than to center one's life wherever it is on Christ. Christ will be your binding address. And if you make Christ your binding address, wherever you are, there will be sanctity. Because it is only in Christ's passion, death, and resurrection that we can discern this point of contact. And only Christ can bring life out of death because he was the first who brought death into life. His theandric death, I mean. Only he can give us a home not built on sand. The saint of today is therefore going to be one who has palpably felt the end of the world in his or her soul. And I don't mean doomsday. The saint of today will also therefore be one who sees, even if just through a connatural instinct, the prolepsis of heaven and hell in his or her encounters with the world. And the saint of today, like Christ, with the possessed man in the gathering district, will therefore of necessity provoke even, as the gospel says, while the saint is still far off, while Christ is far off. The saint will be that point of contact between heaven and hell, entering into the drama of Christ's passion and sharing it. This is the Christian vocation. Yes, we are to seek salvation. What is that? For us, the baptized salvation means participating via faith and grace in Christ's cruciform structure. Yes, risen, but cruciform first, which includes also his descent into hell. Our sanctity, therefore, is missional, cruciform, participatory, vicarious, and willing to descend into the pits of hell for the other. And the saint must enter into that prolepsis of hell and bring heaven with him or her when she does. There is great peril in this, obviously, which is why we need prayer and fasting to cast some of these demons out. But the saint of today will be someone who lives in the metaxu, the betweenness of heaven and earth, who senses both heaven and hell within that space, that opaque interregnum between regimes of heaven and hell, and who seeks to live in such a way that he or she is constantly stretched out, poured out. We are to be ad orientum people, with backs made for carrying the load of those behind us, forward and upward. The modern saint, therefore, is going to be someone with a deep capacity for a supernaturally given level of empathy that leads to an equally supernatural embodiment of compassion. But both are to be so genuine that there will be no question of a false toleration masquerading as compassion. C.S. Lewis pointed that out long ago. So much of what we call compassion today is simply kindness. And kindness devoid of orientation to goodness is actually a form of contempt. The kind of empathy that leads to a compassion that is a genuine vicarious stepping through of the pit that people are in. I suspect, therefore, that the saint of today, and I mean the kind of saint who really, I have a word here, I'm not going to say it, who really gets under your skin, all right, uh, inwardly, and because you secretly suspect them of being a bit unhinged, is going to be someone who is a bit of an outlier, who lives equally from within the heart of the Christ and his church and from within the worldliness of the world. In other words, I suspect that the hour of the weirdos is upon us. <laughs> because, you know, saints can be weird. They can be truly weird. Dorothy Day was weird. She was a strange woman. 
Now is the time, because if now is the time also of monsters, so too is the time for holy outliers who seek to refine what, redefine what counts as real life. And is that not the problem? The problem, the idolatry of every dayness, the, hegem the, the, the hegemony that modernity has upon us is that it robs us of the imaginative capacity to imagine differently. And that's what the saints give us, the capacity to imagine differently. And such a modern saint will most often find, maybe not most often, often find, a, a certain kind of status quo Catholicism so unpalatable that they just can't stomach it anymore since that form of Catholicism has glued itself quite often at the hip to social forms that are toxic to the faith. And I, I doubt most of us, I know I don't, have the capacity for such freakishness, but at the very least we should admire it, support it, and cheer it on when it appears, perhaps emulate it in some small way. Vatican II sought to retrieve a robust sense of the universal cult to holiness, and I commend it for doing so. But its language is still in this regard, I'm gonna offer a small critique here, was still too larded with the ecclesio speak of words that sound great but really have little meaning. Its words do not inspire. It reads exactly like a schoolmarmy lecture written by a committee of clerical theologians trying to get the theology right, which Ratzinger pointed out is exactly one of the problems. We were theologians, he said, and we were too worried about getting the theology right. It needed to be more prophetic and to set aside the safe bromides about sanctity in an ecclesial context that makes it sound as if we are talking about the lace doily pieties of a kind of Baroque tonality. Now is the time of the laity. Now is the time for a revolution in the church of a lay-centered spirituality and sanctity characterized by this kind of an engagement, even if it means going into a desert place. Because we live in the Metaxu, is a particularly, and living so is a particularly late charism, and that charism is to live in that prolepsis of heaven and hell. I further suspect, therefore, the kind of sanctity we will see today is of a new kind that will give the appearance of a kind of worldliness that maybe many pious and tender souls might find a bit shocking. We will see more and more holy people speaking openly of their their foreshadowing or prolepsis of heaven as requiring of them a descent into the foreshadowing of hell, with Christ as the point of contact that makes this action possible. And this descent can and will take on many different forms depending on your state of life, but the common denominator that will link all such characters together is their irreducibility to the old categories and a new way of diving into vicarious suffering. The grass is growing through the sidewalk, though, and the spirit does truly still inspire new movements. And I'm struck in particular by how many saintly women, in particular, I find intriguing and interesting, beacons of hope. The first one I mentioned might be a little controversial, but I admire her greatly and read her writings to great merit. I think here of the French mystic and philosopher Simone Weil, who, though profoundly drawn to Catholicism, remained at arm's length from the church for most of her life for reasons too complex to discuss here. Nevertheless, she is perhaps one of the most profound religious thinkers of the modern secular era and is an example of the kind of alienated faith that is so common today. She just had a lot of intellectual honesty. Okay? And, and like I said, I don't really have too much time to go into all the reasons why she, she was offered baptism, she wanted baptism, she refused baptism. So by the definition of certain traditionalists, she's in hell, right? She knew, what, she knew that the church was the true church of Christ. She knew she should be baptized. She refused baptism and, and remained at arm's length from the church. I don't know, but her reasons were the church of her time was in solidarity with the wealthy and the oppressors. Therefore, she couldn't in conscience join that church out of solidarity with the poor. Now, she was wrong about that. She's wrong in many levels about that. And yet, one has to, I think, admire and respect the fact that she took Christ so seriously and his cruciform structure and wanted to live her life in that way that she could not even affix herself to his church. Now, I wouldn't recommend that. I wish she had. And some say she did get baptized, but I'm not certain. I'm not certain. I wish she had been baptized. But that's not my point. Not my point. 
She was weird. Yep. And her mortifications were too severe. She probably died because she starved herself to death. But weren't St. Francis of Assisi's mortifications too severe by a certain modern metric? He died young, after all, and by all accounts, probably because his mortifications were too severe. So I'm not saying this to criticize St. Francis, but to point out this is what I'm talking about. Sometimes I think modern saints are going to make us uncomfortable. I think of another French woman, Madeleine Delbrel, whose life went from lukewarm, who I quoted earlier, went from lukewarm Catholic to overt atheist and then back to a radical form of Catholic living. She became a nurse in order to live in the world in solidarity with the poor, but who also built writing as her vocation in order to communicate to the world certain spiritual insights. And those insights are profound. And of course, there's also my hero, Dorothy Day. People often ask me what is, the most, what is it that most attracts me to her and her way of life and her thought. And my answer is always the same. She understood alienation. And she was familiar with all the Marxist misuses of that often overused and shop-worn category. And she wanted to retrieve the concept from the Marxists and to place it within a Christological context. In this regard, her sanctity took the form of a union with the crucified Christ, who alone suffered the deepest aliena alienation in his kenosis into death and hell, and who therefore alone can bring true spiritual healing to all. And insofar as the church accommodated itself to a structure of existence that was not that, she held up her own prophetic witness as a counter, as a counter to that. How much time do I have here? Eight o'clock? Okay. Here I will appeal to a central concept of Hans Urs von Balthasar, which he calls the valor of the unshielded heart, which one can find in his uh, Theological Aesthetics, Volume 4. Quote, and he's, and he's talking here, he's talking here about Greek tragedy. He's talking about the foreshadowing of Christ's cruciform existence in the Greek tragedians. This quote, but the situation in which this truth emerges is now that of suffering, speaking of the Greek trage tragedians, that of suffering, which lays man bare in his vulnerability, forcibly exposing and humiliating him. Only a great and majestic human being is equal to this. He alone can bear such a burden, and only from him, when he is finally and necessarily broken apart, can there arise like a fragrance, the pure essence of humankind, indeed of being as such. What is unprecedented here is that the suffering is neither denied nor is it shunned as an unattainable eudaimonia, but rather it is seen as the way of man to God and the revelation of the deep truth of existence passes directly through the most extreme form of suffering. That is the valor of the unshielded heart which philosophy will lack and which stands in a direct foreshadowing to Christ." End quote. As I said, Balthasar's tracing of the metaphysics of classical antiquity. And in a penetrating analysis notes that the Greek tragedians, unlike their professional contemporary, philosophical contemporaries, viewed man's dignity as somehow mysteriously related to the glory that emanates from the realm of the gods, linking glory from the gods with their own suffering. As Balthasar says, in tragedy, man acts against the background of the god, and man only reveals himself emerging into the light of his own truth because of the appearance of the God, even in wrath and concealment." End quote. In tragedy, the existence of the gods is taken seriously, and it is the final victory and glorification of the gods that forms the backdrop of the dramatic action that unfolds. It is a liturgy of suffering. That is Balthasar's take on the tragedies. What the Greeks lacked, of course, is the revelation of the glory of Christ. The sacred heart of Jesus is the most unshielded heart possible, and therefore after him no tragedy in a high register is any longer possible. Greek tragic figures such as Oedipus and Antigone really were guilty of something, and thus their sufferings are ultimately the result of divine justice, but without any hope of reparation or restoration. Their unshielded hearts therefore had valor as they accepted their fate with a dignified moral resolve, but in the end their fate though epiphanic, is ambiguous and tragic. And the inherent inscrutability of the world of the gods means that the questions of man's tragic fate is left hanging. In other words, is human tragedy a merely penultimate reality awaiting a future resolution, or is it our ultimate end? Is that all we are? Is this wound 
which bleeds into us without ceasing, the wound of existence, ever to end? Or are we destined to suffer the futility of an endlessly repeating nightmare forever? Is the machinery of divine justice like a set of automatic gears in which we will all be ground up and pulverized, or will there be some sort of hoyeristic denouement to the whole affair that speaks of mercy? The tragedians do not say, because they cannot say. But the fact that the human characters show up at all speaks to the importance of the moral dimension, to their freedom. In Christ, there is no such ambiguity, no tragic fate that is a result of his sins, and, no, and certainly no hint of a divine justice that is without mercy or reparative grace. Christ's human soul is uniquely unshielded insofar as it is an utterly open soul to both his Father's will and to those who his Father has given to him, all of us. His entire existence can be defined as pro nobis, a man for others, and whose mission is precisely to be completely broken open in order to bear the sins of the world through a mysterious exchange wherein he takes into his unshielded soul the full existential weight and consequence for our sins. What can that mean? Who can fathom its depths? St. Paul says that Christ became sin, became sin for our sakes, which underscores everything I'm saying. But what? What depths? Therefore, modern forms of sanctity viewed, viewed within the parameter of this Balthazarian tonality will exhibit this valor of the unshielded heart as our response to the ants fall crisis of our times for the sake of the world. It will open itself to what I call the hermeneutics of the abyss, which will take seriously the phenomenology of modern unbelief and even the de facto atheism of so many in the church. I believe it was Charles Peggy who once wrote that modern Christianity is characterized by the presence of believers who no longer believe. And of course, Ratzinger said the same. And lurking beneath it all is a spiritual boredom, a boredom that is far deeper than anything. It is into this abyss, into the hell of dissolution, that Christ descends. He descends into the horror that is more than the experience of the absence of God, but is rather the horror of a meaningless abyss so deep that it swallows up and devours in an act of rapacious spiritual revenge. All attempts to intrude into this abyss from the realm of love as a form of alienation that must be resisted and destroyed. It is indeed the violent who bear the kingdom away. And that is hell. Hell is the continual eternal resistance to Christ's constant overtures of stripping, stripping us bare so that we may enter into the kingdom. Thus, heaven and hell are both Christological categories and both find their home in the valor of Christ's unshielded sacred heart. Therefore, our sanctity must imitate this pattern of Christ. I will end, therefore, hey, hooray, I'm done. I will end, therefore, with the analysis of Joseph Ratzinger once again, Pope Benedict, where what I mean by the valor of the unshielded heart in doing in our sanctity becomes clearer by way of contrast with the current milieu. Ratzinger commenting on the fact that even the little flower, that even St. Therese of Lisieux suffered powerful temptations to atheism, states in his wonderful book that I would recommend everybody read, Ratzinger's book, Introduction to Christianity, he wrote in the late 60s. He states, quote, speaking of St. Therese, her mind is beset by every possible argument against the faith. The sense of believing seems to have vanished. In other words, someone here catches a glimpse of the abyss lurking under the firm structure of the supporting conventions. In a situation like this, what is in question is not the sort of thing that one perhaps quarrels about otherwise, the dogma of the assumption, the proper use of confession. All this becomes absolutely secondary. What is at stake is the whole structure. It is a question of all or nothing. That is the only remaining alternative. Nowhere does there seem anything to cling to in this sudden fall. Wherever one looks, only the bottomless abyss of nothingness can be seen." End quote. He's talking about Therese. And as we float, as we float over the abyss below, 
like the shipwrecked Jesuit in Paul Claudel's Solier de Sati. All we have to cling to is a wooden floating plank, a plank which in Claudel's story symbolizes the cross of Christ. And it is that plank which must be for us today our deepest metric of public truth, that small plank, that wooden plank, that thin floating arboreal presence upon which hung the savior of the world, our only savior. Thank you.